Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership Podcast with ID3 for Isaiah Drone III. This show was designed to provide an exclusive forum on educational achievement gaps related to learner success while discovering relationships and family issues in a diverse setting. All right. What well, is the another night of the Impact of Educational Leadership, episode 27? I'm your host, ID3 for IGL Drone Third. Tonight's panelists are Dr. Maristella Jimenez and Rick Bole. All right, tonight's uh, topic is what motivates students to succeed. Uh, first, let me start with Dr. Jimenez. So Dr. Marcela Jimenez was born in Guanchuto, Mexico, but migrated to the United States in 1992. She lives in Spring, Texas. In her career, Dr. Jimenez has developed a broad and diverse professional work experience in the private and public sector, including global retailers, government, healthcare, nonprofits, higher education, hospitality. Her key role is to lead human resource departments for South American companies. Dr. Jimenez completed a quantitative research study during her dissertation involving managers, emotional intelligence. She has held faculty roles in higher education institutions, teaching master degrees and PhD courses for students. She is certified on emotional intelligence and is currently completing a Global Talent Management Leader Certification at University of Pennsylvania. She is committed to giving back to the community through various voluntary activities and by sharing her professional skills to help adults advance their professional careers. Next, we have on the panel, Mr. Rick Bollet. Mr. Rick Bollet is starting his 17th year in public education and holds a Bachelor's of Science in Music Education from Indiana University. Has a Master's of Science and degree in Educational Administration and Leadership. Um, and he is an orator, as you will see tonight. He is currently teaching music, secondary education, near Fort Hood, Kling Independent School District. He is the founding member of an organization called the Alliance for Young Men of Bell County. He uh, was recently selected as one of the 15 members from across the state of Texas to participate in the National Education Association's Educator's Voice. Please say hello to the people. Why, hello, and uh, Dr. Jimenez, I never realized we had so many connections. Uh, I'm a native Mainer and have a friend on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, so it's good to be here with you, and Mr. Drone, it's always a pleasure to, to be here with you. Yes, likewise. Well, the pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. Well, here we go. So, what motivates students to succeed? Trust between all parties of the school community is vital for enhancing the school's effectiveness because it supports the parents and teachers' faith in each other's motives and actions. Community partnership programs are also important because it sends the message to students that the adults in their lives, both teachers and parents, are willing to make time to support students' educational experiences and efforts. First, tonight we have Mr. Rick Bollet. I want to direct this first question to you, sir. He does experiences with civic involvement activities enhance students' performance outcomes. Well, again, thank you for having me on. Uh, and I would say that it does more than enhance it, that those involvements are vital to any society in order to function properly. Uh, when I first moved here, I heard a saying from a native that said, good fences make good neighbors. And that always puzzled me. And it's always puzzled me that civic isolation gets put forward as not only a viable solution, but an ideal one. Uh, because that civic engagement provides for public input, in, input and information to the representatives that they elect to handle the day-to-day -day functions of governance. Um, 
There's a school board member in my school district said the other day that when we delegate authority to people, we don't give it away. We still retain oversight over what they do. And sometimes I think we as a public treat our elected officials as if they are kind of a hire and forget thing, when in reality they need our continued input and, and sometimes our, our, our boundaries, right? And our children, you know, the bigger reality here we need to realize is that public participation in society makes us better. When we all bring our ideas to the table, we benefit uh, because we're bigger than the sum of our parts. Uh, our military is built on the idea of a crucible, that rising to overcoming the obstacles that are contained within a test makes us stronger. And so we need to make sure that we include our children and raise our children to function in our society in that same way. That we and they can benefit and grow from sharing our experiences, our ideas, our joys, our sorrows, our concerns. And by having them participate and be part of that societal change, and we can use that to work together to come overcome threat, right? But it can't just be in cases of disaster. It can't just be in moments like now where we're, you know, many of us are sheltered in place. It has to be a continual and a purposeful involvement that happens all the time. So if a student isn't involved in our society during their formative stages, they're more likely to continue that trend as an adult. Um, so that needs to happen early, it needs to happen often, and children need to feel involved in their government and in what they do in terms of their education and their society. So it's a seed that we need to plant and cultivate, and if we do that, then our society is going to harvest those benefits. Wonderful response, and I, I totally agree with that. Societal change cannot happen without successful public participation. So it is necessary in raising our students. Dr. Maricela Jimenez, so what professional developmental tools and software are available to assist teachers, instructors, mentors, and effectiveness toward improving instructional quality teaching? Um, thank you, Ari Fire, for having me. And I'm going to answer that question just very simply, <clears throat> instead of offering multiple ways to um, speaking about the, the teachers, the school, and then the students. <clears throat> but you know, some of the tools available right now, it's not it's not that they are not effective. It's that uh, teachers would need to learn a new way of developing their classes and using those tools. It's, it's that the main thing that they need to do is understand the students and expose them to new ways of learning. It, it's not even technology, it's just a new way of communication and getting, um, getting that information to students at their level. One example that I can offer you is the, the students now work and communicate through their phone. They use a lot of apps. They may have many apps in their phone. One of them is GroupMe, uh, Twitter, you know, Pinterest, Feedly, Doodle, Tideboard, and who doesn't know YouTube? But um, I think it's, it's what uh, the students need to communicate with the teachers and say, lectures no longer work. Uh, this is the technology that helps me learn. There are so many ways to, to learn, and number one is visually, learning visually. So I believe that it, it's time to stop that essay, you know, it's time, it's, time, it's time to stop the excessive page of writing, um, and instead it's time to start using conceptual and experiential learning to teach students to think critically, to teach them how to find relevant solutions to problems. You know, there's a real world outside the classroom, so it's time to bring that real story into the curriculum. And in the real world, solutions are expected and not just a nicely written essay or presentation. Everything teacher, you know, every, everything uh, teachers teach must be crafted with real world experiences. And they have to go outside and see what uh, employers are going to be asking for. And, and then craft their curriculum to to align the new expectations of the real world. Because it doesn't matter if the student is in middle school, high school, or, or um, college, if they are learning just things that are um, not going to prepare them for the real world, it doesn't matter what technologies are being used if they are not 
tackling the real the real issue to learning. Learning is now about developing solutions to problems, problems that are uh, real, and that's what's going to get the uh, the future uh, student and slash employee hired. So is that the technologies definitely have to be visual, and they have to be. Uh, very specific, very simplified, and um, eliminate a lot of the excessive writing. That's, that's not going to hire the, the future employee. Uh, the students are definitely a new generation and they need to be uh, taught new ways to identify and then develop solutions not just uh, for uh, for work, but even for themselves as they make decisions, even simple solutions to to um, addressing addressing next phase um, approach of completing their assignment or building networks. It's, it's just it's just a more complex world. And so to answer your question, it is going to be a combination of simplicity and see what the students are doing and how they are learning and then apply it. That was a wonderful explanation of how to use those different instruments to work everything together. And I just really like the description of how you unpack all that information. It, you gave us a lot, a lot to chew on and for those listeners that are going to be listening in later on. But thank you for that response. Mr. Rick Bollet, next question goes to you, sir. Uh, what are some motivational barriers that you can uh, could experience in civic involvement? Uh, motivational barriers that youth could experience and how can we teach them to navigate through that in terms of civic involvement? Well, for starters, uh, fix ourselves and our own behavior as the adult. Uh, you remember that old saying that little pitchers have big ears? Um, kids see and hear a lot more of what we as adults say than we give them credit for. Uh, most children and young adults lack the emotional and developmental maturity to identify and understand what they're going through. Uh, and they lack the experience to be able to properly put the comments that they see and hear in context. Now, if you think about how adults function and behave towards themselves on social media, uh, you're going to see that our own behavior is a huge part of that motivational barrier issue because kids are not motivated to, to, to open themselves up in that way. Because so many of us as adults already do not foster or even tolerate dissenting opinions in our civic discussions that occur online. It's often aggressive, it's often toxic, and a lot of times what we see on social media can carry over into, as Dr. Jimenez referred to, as you know, the real world or the 3D world. Um, they hear and see a lot more often than any of us are willing to admit, and they end up internalizing it. Uh, without having an understanding of it or an emotional ability to process it. So, and what they internalize along with it is kind of this unspoken lesson that teaches them to avoid backlash and stay in their own bubbles, right? And that's especially true during the current pandemic that we're in uh, and its social distancing provisions. But we also have an opportunity right now to reverse that same trend by changing how we act uh, when we're in those smaller, tiny bubbles. Uh, in a quick reference to what Dr. Jimenez says, I also think that's going to kickstart a lot of teachers into the 21st century in terms of their teaching methods. The second part, I think, includes governments being more inclusive towards public comment and input, especially at the local and the educational levels. Uh, there's been lots of cases where governments, we see that all the, all the time on the news, that actively work to prevent input in our government. And you have to wonder what message that sends our young people. Because interests, just like a garden, they grow more strongly and productively when you cultivate them. And if we don't cultivate that interest, they're not going to have an interest. The third thing, I think, would be to uh, ensure that we have a robust curriculum that teaches both the principles and the mechanics of civics. Because if you understand something, you are more likely to be involved in it. So education is always uh, is a key here in terms of navigation of any barriers, motivational, emotional, physical, or otherwise. Uh, in terms of how we handle ourselves. And I think if we address those things and address how we treat each other, uh, which I'm hopeful happens uh, in the next few weeks and months so we can learn a few lessons about ourselves and each other, then I think we could have an opportunity to actually increase civic involvement uh, throughout the process for, for our kids and for our adults as well. 
Thank you for that response. I like the way you uh, piggyback on what Dr. Jimenez said about the professional development, though you didn't use that word specifically, but you alluded to it and how it's going to help us in assisting uh, teachers' effectiveness and improving their instructional qualities by knowing their students and knowing their learning measurabilities per each student, meaning that you know each student learns differently. And so as a master teacher, you find out what makes this child or student learn best. And so you can now change your approach uh, throughout the classroom, across the board, you name it. I also like the way you pointed out uh, how observation is so important to observe the activities and the behaviors, the actions, observing the conversations, the interpersonal interactions between those students on every tier, even higher education, but from secondary edu education, pre-K education, all the way up uh, to help define the organizational structure, especially with this uh, social distancing new phenomenon that has come into play, which ties us into the human experience going forward. And that ties me into my next question for Dr. Jimenez, as a matter of fact. Uh, so Dr. Jimenez, question for you, how can we improve youth motivation to be more uh, committed, to have more commitment, and to be more organized when dealing with or interacting with our youth? Uh, yeah, so you know, motivation is very broad and we have many, many theories, but let's begin with understanding and reflecting about the most fundamental needs of youth. The big question to ask and clarify is, are the most fundamental needs being met in this youth? Think about that, about the youth that we know, whether is uh, when we were growing up or we have uh, nieces or nephews or little brothers live in a healthy, in functioning family and do they feel loved? Do they feel safe and accepted? Are there parents around? Are, is it just one parent? Is it both parents? What's their relationship with each other and what are they modeling to the, to the kids? You know, it begins in the home and now if they do not have their fundamental needs met, that means that it's going to be very challenging to motivate them. You know, by no means, the role of a mentor is crucial, crucially needed. I think this is when schools and support systems and organizations can lend a hand and identify that this youth have great potential, but because uh, their fundamental needs not being met, this, this is going to be a, a motivational barrier. You see, the way we motivate youth is by ensuring that their fundamental needs are met in a nurturing environment. And then the second environment is to tap into their natural talents and aspirations and begin to guide, support, and, and encourage them. Um, then once we identify that, yes, they, they have, uh, we have satisfied their fundamental needs, they feel lost, they feel uh, safe, and they, they feel accepted, which is critical for their self-esteem, then we can begin to nurture and motivate them and, and feed them differently. Uh, and so it's, it's very important that we understand the uh, order in how we need to motivate them and everyone is different, whether it's a young female or young male, we need to understand uh, their background. And uh, sadly, sometimes we bundle all the youth together in the same program. And this is the reason why many programs are not effective. Um, the program itself may be great, structurally uh, designed, but because every youth brings a different background and a set of um, understanding about who he or she is in context of the environment, whether it's a school or home. So let's begin to identify going back, back to the basics and then we can take it from there to motivate them. I love how you talked about balancing out the communication is what I got and, and relationship modeling and knowing how to hone in and find the talents of each of your students and, and developing those talents where they are, meeting them where they are at, where they are. I love it because that shows caring, that builds confidence, it builds character in those students and it gives community and it gives community, it gives connection, 
which helps community partnerships, community partnerships. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful response, uh, Dr. Jimenez, wonderful. My next question is going to Mr. Rick Black. What are some goals and directions we should expect from successful civic involvement or civic involvement activities? Well, assuming the stuff that I mentioned before happens and the stuff that Dr. Jimenez mentioned before happens, I, I think we should see uh, a direction of increased involvement by uh, wider and more diverse ranges of citizens than we've seen over the last few years or even decades. I think that one thing that we should look and push for is that that involvement extends beyond the electoral process. A lot of focus gets put on that. I know we've seen a lot of news about you know, how Bernie Sanders is exciting younger voters. But that excitement and that energy needs to translate to the processes of civic government as well, to town and city council meetings, to school board meetings, to student councils in their schools, involvement with their classes, and to other civic and community groups. Uh, if you're doing this right, you should see that involvement in uh, many areas across, across a wide swath of society. It's not always going to be pretty, especially in the earlier stages, because people are not used to being involved in that manner. But once you set that participation level as an intention and it's a standard of a functioning society, you accept it, you listen to it, you work with it, and you harness it, then you're also going to begin to receive and be invigorated by the benefits of that time, energy, and creative investment. So, as I said before, uh, we need to give them a reason to participate. And I'm reminded of a story when uh, I was growing up where we had a music position that was going to be eliminated at the school I was at. And it was a tiny school, and uh, there was only about 85 kids in the entire senior class, but 60 of them bothered to show up to a school board meeting to fight for that teacher's position. We got involved in the civic process, and we made them listen. And we stayed involved with that process um, as a class. And that's something that always stuck with me, is that involvement and that work and that, that civic engagement to overcome barriers and concerns and work through societal issues. You know, as I said before, we've got to give them a reason to participate. This is a reason why they should do that, and everyone benefits from it when they do. Mr. Bollet, one thing that kind of concerns me now, especially with this new phenomenon going on, this new pandemic going on, is this whole social distancing thing. And then they're bringing balance into the mix along with that. And so that's, you know, these are some of, these are some of the new barriers that are emerging, unfortunately, uh, not not just with uh, the U.S. but on a global societal platform. It's a little bit scary, but you know we have hope. We have hope because we have we have people out there that have good hearts still. People out there that still are trying to be positive contributors to society and that people that rise above this senseless violence that's going on in our world right now. Uh, we got people in, in healthcare, we got people in education, we got people, uh, people in the community, the police officers, firemen, people even working at the grocery store, sanitation people, we'll, we'll, we'll applaud all these people, uh, all these ladies and gentlemen, because they are, they're sacrificing not only their time, but they're sacrificing their health, they're, they're sacrificing their lives, and they're putting their lives on the line so that this country uh, will not go under. And so that, that, that's some of the things that we can you know, talk about at another time, but uh, Dr. Jimenez, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that, that was a little emotional for me. Uh, what are some goals and directions we should expect from good social support systems within our communities? Yes, and I think just to echo what both of you have been saying is that we are continually uh, being put in a position of reflection and realizing that sometimes the things that matter the most matter the least. And this, this time is, is definitely an opportunity for all of us to see how we can be um, a contributor and support our community, support our families, and support our uh, those who are actually already um, getting the news that their position is going to be, you know, they're going to be displaced from their employment. But um, it's really uh, very important that 
those social support systems never lose focus on the fundamental needs of every young boy and girl. This is the goal number one. And the reason I say this is because uh, they will be, they are already immersed, they are emerging into the new workforce within the next five years, you know, within the next 10 years. So goal number one is very important that uh, the social uh, support systems never lose focus on the fundamental needs of every young boy and girl. If we nurture them right, then they will turn right. And if parents are not around, then we need mentors. Uh, for me, mentors is very, it's a big emphasis because we have lots of uh, people like you and I, you know, the three of us that do have the time, perhaps one hour a week, to reach out to a, a young boy or girl and then just guide them. Sometimes that's all they need. They just need someone to guide them. And, and they, they need that support system. They need to feel approved. So that's number two. If the um, system at home is not working, then we reach out to the systems in the community. You know, in the Bible, there are older men and women encouraged to model specific behaviors that will serve to bring good outcomes in the life of the younger people watching. And people are always watching us. Younger people are watching us. If you, if you do right, they watch. If you do wrong, they watch. And so as adults, we have to take it very personal in knowing that someone is watching us and role model behaviors that are acceptable that will encourage our youth to imitate because in the coming years, they will be in charge of the world activity in every industry. And so we, we have to keep that in mind. They are going to replace us and we need to be the ones to guide them um, because the complexity of, of what's coming is, is definitely not going to be simple on the fundamental needs of every young boy and girl. This is goal number one. And the reason I say this is because uh, they will be, they are already immersed, they are emerging into the new workforce within the next five years, you know, within the next 10 years. So goal number one is very important that uh, the social uh, support systems never lose focus on the fundamental needs of every young boy and girl. If we nurture them right, then they will turn right. And if parents are not around, then we need mentors. Uh, for me, mentors is very, it's a big emphasis because we have lots of uh, people like you and I, you know, the three of us that do have the time, perhaps one hour a week, to reach out to a, a young boy or girl and then just guide them. Sometimes that's all they need. They just need someone to guide them. And, and they, they need that support system. They need to feel approved. So that's number two. If the um, system at home is not working, then we reach out to the systems in the community. You know, in the Bible, there are older men and women encouraged to model specific behaviors that will serve to bring good outcomes in the life of the younger people watching. That's, that's really what is very important. So those two goals are critical. You know, Dr. Jimenez, that really, really brings me to my next point because you are so aligned with what I am thinking, what I have in my, my notes here, because we, we're gonna need new strategies now. We're gonna need new strategies now for, as it relates to positive youth development, especially for, especially for connecting youth considered to be at risk or you know, inner city kids, and we're gonna really need to give them good uh, modeling or examples of what success looks like, especially because let's face it, America is now, after we, after this thing is over, we will be on a rebuilding platform. We're gonna have to rebuild the whole infrastructure of this entire country. And so the schools and other settings that, you know, influence the learning environment. All that's going to change now. The, the way we teach is going to change now. But because of this whole epidemic, because of this whole pandemic episode, there's going to be a lot of healing that's going to go on. A lot of people have lost their lives. A lot of people are, are, are ill. There are even projections that if this plague doesn't stop, the death toll is going to go up increasingly. It's just unthinkable where we're gonna be at 
in the next 30 days. Um, sorry about that. Mr. Mr. Boulay, sir, sorry. My next question is to you. As, as a developed country, why should so much of our local budget go to education? Well, first of all, no apologies needed. Uh, you are speaking your truth, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, as to why so much of our local budget should go to education, uh, an educated populace is a sign of a developed country. If you look throughout the course of history, there are very few of the great civilizations with the possible exception of the Mayan. Uh, none of them had an uneducated population. And I should clarify by saying that by great, I do not necessarily mean powerful. There have been some very, very powerful civilizations and, some, and leaders, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, the Third Reich, for some examples. They were strong, they were powerful, but they were built solely on force and not on education. And in the end, they didn't last very long from either a historical or a military perspective. But the great civilizations, on the other hand, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Aztecs, and even the Vikings, to an extent, all believed in and invested in education as a building block for their society. So even though they had flaws that eventually brought them down, they lasted for hundreds and even thousands of years. So for me, the lesson there is pretty clear. If you are looking to build a civilization that lasts, then your society had better value the power of education in making that happen. You know, one of the blueprints that really makes the American people what they are is that the, the spirit of faith and courage and patriotism, you know, to, to just propel us to protect ourselves, protect our country, and to be selfless in times of need like this. And I am believing that the new, the new ways of doing things is, is going to come much sooner. In, in our schools for our children because they are the ones that are being most vulnerable. We do understand that our uh, community of seniors, they are being very vulnerable, but our children are the ones that are right now being deprived of education. I'm reminded of, of Albert Einstein's old saying that in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Uh, I would add to that that adversity forces change. And I think that if you combine those together, you look at the things you know that Dr. Jimenez has pointed out in terms of where uh, educationally our society needs to change. And where in terms of civic engagement, like I have pointed out, that our society needs to change. And I think we have opportunities in the midst of the adversity that we are currently in to be able to bring some lasting, fundamental, and positive change. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for joining in. Tonight was another night of the Impact Special Education Leadership. This was episode 27. I'm your host, ID3. Our panelists tonight were Dr. Marcella Jimenez and Rick Bolle. Good night. Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership Podcast with ID3 for Isaiah Drone III. This show was designed to provide an exclusive forum on educational achievement gaps related to learner success while discovering relationships and family issues in a diverse setting.